So for those of you that are visiting, thanks for coming. We've actually been in church almost all week. We started out Sunday, Sunday night, actually sun, Sunday morning, Sunday morning with uh, Michael Kirby from Mount, Pro Mount Prospect Baptist Church in, in, uh, in Georgia. And they're coming back up in June. Uh, we're doing VBS and some other things with them. But Michael started out talking about how to prepare for revival or things that might be hindrance to revival. And, and uh, as he began to preach, a lot of people uh, wanted me to actually, I need to get a truck outside to sell still-toed shoes. <laughs> because he was all over feet every which way. For those of you that weren't here, you missed it. That's all I can say. You really missed it. He talked about forgiveness. He talked about endurance. Uh, and the other two, I can't remember. No, no complaining. Yes. So, for, and, and know what? Oh, no grumbling. Yes, which... I hope and pray that all of you will respect that today. <laughs> For the next 45 minutes, I'll, I'll try to, to get it done. And then he ended on encouragement. Yes, and then he ended on encouragement. And so we have actually been in a series of messages called Hope for Cracked Pots. Okay? Or does God use cracked pots is what we're going to talk about today. Because one of the things that we're going to be talking about is, is found in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 6 to 7. So you can kind of grab your Bibles, go to there. Mark will pull it up in a minute, and, and we'll read it. But this scripture in 2 Corinthians is, is really a, a good scripture when Paul is talking about. But I've lived in Ohio all of my life, except when I was in the service for eight years. I lived in Maryland for four and then in Germany for four. But I've lived in this area uh, the other 54 years uh, of my life in Ohio. And, and so there's some things that are kind of consistent all across this nation. There are some things that are kind of unique to Ohio. And some of the things that you can understand is that here are some things that you know that you're from this area and that is this have you ever had to switch from heat to cool on the same day the value of a parking spot is based upon where's the shade you or someone that you know and this used to be a long time ago, not so much today. You or someone that you know had a belt buckle bigger than your fist. Remember those days? You knew that you were from Ohio when someone had plans to get a wedding or they were going to get married, but they first had to consult the football schedule. Used to, in Ohio, you would find movie rentals, ammunition, beer, and bait in the same store. They wouldn't be spread out. You say you're going to stop for a Coke and you get a Pepsi. And everybody would say, can I get a Coke? And you give them a Coke and they say, no, that's not what I'm asking for. I want a Pepsi or a soda. How about your grandma? Your grandmother's car is a dually. Or you've eaten little smokies in a crock pot for special occasions. Or you've ever gone to White Castle at two o'clock in the morning and you know the five other people that are there. 
it, it, used to, it used to be Dixie Hamburger, but that, I couldn't use that one anymore because nobody would know what that is. And you know what it means when someone says to you, I'm fixing to go. Well, I'm fixing to tell you what God said about using all kinds of people. Okay? He can even use people from Ohio. As weird and as strange as we may be sometimes. So, when we come into 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and verse, verses 6 and 7 here. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 actually presents some weaknesses. And it also talks about not only weaknesses in the human being or, 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 or Christians or humans, but it also talks about living of the resurrection life, okay? And then when you go to, to chapter 5 of there, you'll find that probably 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and chapter 5 are probably two of the most important chapters in the Bible. They actually do rate right up there with John chapter 3 when Jesus is talking to Nicodemus and Nicodemus comes and asks him, good master, what must I do to be saved? And Jesus begins to explain to him what he needs to do. In John chapter 14, when the, the disciples are having some issues and Jesus begins to comfort them and tells them, hey, listen, guys, I'm going away. But don't worry about it. Don't let your hearts be troubled. I go away, but I go to prepare a place for you. That where I am, there you may be also. Also talking about in Romans chapter 7, where Paul talks about us being released from the law and being bound to Christ. So, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7, look at what he has to say. He says, for God who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of God's glory in the face of Jesus Christ. Now we have this treasure in clay jars so that this extraordinary power may be from God and not from us. Okay, so what you begin to understand is that God is trying to tell us that in these clay jars, there's some treasure. It's not just something that doesn't really mean anything, but there is something very worthwhile that God wants you to know. Many times people will tell you you're worthless, you don't mean anything, but God wants to let you know that you are. He wants to let you know how much that he cares for you. And how much that he loves you. So when he begins to start telling us, he says, listen, I want you to know that you are struggling and that you are battling the age of this God of darkness. And this God of darkness is trying his best to stop anything and everything that has light in it. He doesn't want it to be there. He doesn't want it to show. A few years ago, there was a case that was starting to go in the city of Houston, Texas. They had gotten a new mayor. And the new mayor wanted to take the whole city of Houston into a certain area. And so she declared that she wanted all the sermons of all the pastors to be given to them before they were to speak. And then they wanted them to go back and grab the sermons that they had spoken about for about the last three to six months. And they were going to take them to court for proclaiming certain issues that they didn't like in that city. Well, guess what? It didn't go anywhere. But it's coming back. 
where Satan does not want the message of truth to get out. He wants us to stay in an age of blindness. And he wants you to know that to you, to him, there is no God. And that God doesn't live in you. And God really doesn't care about you. Because if God cared about you, you wouldn't be in the situation that you're in. Things would be a lot better. People would love you and people would, would just adore you, but they don't. So evidently there's something wrong with God. He's not as loving as you think. But we want to talk about where God uses cracked pots today. What we want to start out with is we just want to talk about a plain pot, okay? Nothing about it, it's just a pot. Maybe it has a little bit about it, but my humanity and your humanity is just like a cracked pot or an empty jar. There's nothing there, nothing at all. The word for cracked clay pots is the Greek word that is called ostrakonos, which literally means earthenware. It was used to describe ordinary run-of-the-mill pieces of pottery that was made out of dirt. That's all it was. Nothing fancy about it at all. But yet, when they were talking about this plain clay pot made out of dirt, and it was just an ordinary run-of-the-mill pot, they forgot about Genesis chapter 2, where God said that he made us from the dust of the earth. Just ordinary run-of-the-mill dirt. But yet he took that dirt and fashioned it into who we are. Into the most, most beautiful creation that he made. Not an ordinary piece of something to just kind of throw away, as people would say. So what we need to understand is, as people is that out in California, there's a new line of psychoanalysis, okay? And they're always trying to come up with new ways to, to analyze this and analyze that. And it's actually called psychoceramics because it deals with cracked pots. And listen, whether you like it or not, every one of us are cracked and flawed. There's something wrong with each and every one of us. None of us are absolutely perfect. Amen. There's an imperfection somewhere, someplace. Somewhere. And what God wants you to know is that he's going to use that cracked pot. It's not one that has to be perfect all the time. And so, what would happen is that just like some of the clay pots in the Old Testament, they're half-baked. I'm just trying to be nice. So don't look at your next door neighbor and say, and I told you, you were half-baked. It just wasn't all there. Okay? But I need you to do me a favor. I need you to say something out loud with me. Okay? I'm clay. I'm clay. And that's okay. And that's okay. I'm clay, and that's okay. I'm clay, and that's okay. 
I'm clay and that's okay. All right. Now remember that. Next time somebody tells you you're not all right, tell them, I'm clay and I'm okay. And then they'll probably say, glad to meet you, I'm Chuck. So moving on, God can use clay pots because in John chapter 8, in verse number 32, Jesus says this, he says, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. He says, so I'm going to use you in all the things that you have. Now, a pot or a vessel, it's designed to hold something. So each of these pots here were designed to hold something, not itself. It was made to put something in it, to fill it with something. It was to be a vessel to be used for some reason, okay, that was there. Now, when you begin to look at things, if, if I was to um, ask somebody to go to the back and give me a, a, a pot, and they would bring that pot, and they would give it to me, and here I am holding this pot, and there's nothing in it, what good is that pot? Nothing. But if you wanted some peas, right, and I was to put water in there and put the peas in there, all of a sudden, what good is that pot? Or homemade vegetable soup, which would be good. And then it would be great, right? Because now it's got something. But by itself, that pot is just a pot. Until you put something in it. That's the way you and I are. We were made as empty pots. Now you can take and do all you want to in decorating that pot on the outside. You can make that pot look as pretty as you want to make it look. But let me say this to you, it's still a pot. Until you put something in it, then that's when it begins to be worth something. Okay? So what happened was, God takes us. And what he starts doing with this clay pot is he starts bringing people in our lives. And as he brings those people into our lives, he starts putting them into our lives. More and more. And the more and more people that God starts bringing, then we begin to start becoming something. If we were to have nobody in our life, we would be absolutely lonely. We need to have somebody. So God starts bringing those somebodies and starts filling our pots. And as we begin to meet these people, then our life begins to start taking on some things. Maybe they're good people. With good manners, good character. We start hanging around with them and guess what happens? We start developing good character. We start developing good manners. We start becoming somebody of character. But if it seems that all of the people that I'm picking and choosing are of the wrong character and of the wrong fashion and of the wrong mode, guess what I'm going to become? Wrong character, wrong mode. Okay? Now, let me say this to you. I am not saying that as Christians you isolate yourself from everybody. 
what I'm saying is this, and this is what Jesus tries to warn us about, is that I'm bringing people into your life to help you help them. Instead of me taking on their characters, they should be taking on mine. They should be coming this side, not me going to the other side. And this is the part of humanity, because now all of a sudden, this pot begins to start getting bigger and bigger and filled into more and more. And let me say, share something with you. This pot will never, ever get full. There will always be room for someone else and something else to be added in this pot. And continuing as God begins to do these things. And what we need to understand is that God created us to become something important. What God is starting to do. Remember, we, we use the scripture, the verse, that he is the potter and I am the clay. He is molding us and he is fashioning us to look to what he wants to make. And then he starts putting some color and everything in this piece of clay to all of a sudden, it starts looking pretty good. It's looking attractive. And I'm not talking about attractive physically. Because when we start, and we'll show, when we start truly becoming the character of Christ, guess what happens? It begins to start showing a beautiful piece of a creation that was molded in his hands. We sometimes think that God doesn't need anything or anyone, but I have to tell you that is absolutely wrong. Okay, what happens to us, ladies and gentlemen, is we start filling our pot up with millions and millions of things that don't matter. Okay, for instance, we start taking possessions, and those possessions are the most important things of our life, and we start filling our pot up with it. We fill it with possessions, we fill it with money, we, we fill it with relationships that aren't really there and we start filling it up with these things and filling it up with these things and what ends up happening is we really think that God doesn't need anything but let me share with you a little story out of the book of second Kings from a guy by the name of Elisha there was a widow woman and this widow woman she was the wife of a man from the company of the prophets who cried out to Elisha she said listen your servant, my husband, is dead, and you know that he revered, the, he revered the Lord. But now his creditors come to take my two boys as his slaves. Elisha replied to them, well, how can I help you? Tell me, what do you have in your house? Your, your servant has nothing there at all, she said, except a small jar of olive oil. Elisha says, here's what I want you to do. Go around and ask all your neighbors for empty jars. Don't ask for a few. Ask for many. So you know what she did? She went around to every one of her neighbors, okay? And every one of her neighbors were just like us. They canned stuff. So they had all kinds of mason jars, right? Or ball jars or whatever. So they had all the canning jars. Nothing was in them. They'd all finished them up for the winter. It was getting springtime. So they had all these jars. And so what did she do? She brought all of these jars and her house is filled with jars, empty jars. You know what happened? She started pouring into there. She started taking and pouring in the oil into the jar. It's still full. It's still full. It's still full. It's still full. She filled all of the jars and went and sold them in order to have money. And guess what? She still had a jar left. Making sure and that God was taking her and, and doing these things. He said, sell the oil, pay your debts, and live on what is left. Okay? I like to say that there's a parable in there. Even though it's in the Old Testament, and sometimes we don't think there's parables in the Old Testament, but let me say something to you. I think God's telling you, I'll bless you. And I'll never stop blessing you. 
they'll be there. Now what we need to understand is that when we, when we take this pot, ladies and gentlemen, and allow God to fill it with his Holy Spirit into our lives, may I say this to you, as David said, my cup runneth over. It will still continue to flow and still continue to flow and still continue to flow. And guess what? You'll still have enough. And it'll be okay. Well, how do I do that? It's when we allow Christ to live in me like treasure in a jar. We need to understand, listen, that Christianity is not a bunch of rules to follow. It isn't legalistic. Now, maybe some of y'all did this. We all got caught up in the craze. Remember that bracelet that everybody would always wear, WWJD? So that every time that something would happen, we would ask ourselves, what would Jesus do? May I say something to you? I got in a situation I had no clue what Jesus would do. And some of the things that I thought that Jesus would do, no, he didn't. He wanted me to get out of the way so he could do it. And so many times what we're saying is, well, well, I think that's what Jesus would do. And so what they would do is use that as an excuse to do what they did. Well, I got a WWJD you know, bracelet on. So that evidently gives me the power to say that I know what Jesus would do. But it isn't. But may I say this to you? Even if, even if you knew what Jesus would do, who in the world are you to think that you could do it? <laughs> Jesus could calm the waters. Honey, I ain't going out there in a hurricane. I know what Jesus would do. He would say, walk on water, Chucky. <laughs> That's right. But may I say this to you, though? When Jesus was in the middle of the storm, ladies and gentlemen, Jesus held up his hand, and what did he say? Peace be still. Next time you're in a thunderstorm, do that. You try it. Take a picture, but just don't get struck by lightning, okay? May I say this to you? The Christian life, contrary to popular belief, ladies and gentlemen, it is not imitating Jesus. The Christian life is letting Jesus live through us. The reason we get into trouble all the time is because we are trying to do it. And we're trying to do it. And we're trying to do it. And what Jesus is trying to say is let me do it through you. <laughs> you and I, ladies and gentlemen, do not have the strength on our own to fight the enemy. The only way we can fight the enemy is allowing Christ to do it through us. And so we begin to understand what, what's going on. Okay? Paul makes this really clear. He says this in 2 Corinthians 4.10. He says, we always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. He isn't saying that what we do is take the communion wafers and that becomes Jesus in us. Okay? What he's saying is that we hold the resurrection, the life of Jesus Christ living in us. 
The problem is, ladies and gentlemen, that we don't think that Christ can live in us. We don't think that this vessel is worthy. <coughs> and let me say this to you. If Jesus has saved you, he's wanting to live in you. Not outside of you. He wants to fill that pot. And he wants to continue to fill it. And to continue to fill it. And to continue to fill it. Okay? So what we need to understand is the last thing. And that is this. That God delights in using imperfect pots. Okay? Jesus said this. In order to live, you got to die. In order to live, you got to die. So, why is it, God, that why do you want to use a flawed pot to be able to do the things that you want to do? And so what ends up happening is, in order to do that, we've got to let God show us. Because it's from Him and not, not from us. Okay? Now let me say this to you. God can strike a mighty lick even with a crooked stick. It doesn't always have to be so straight. Have you ever tried to hit somebody with a crooked stick? It's kind of hard. Trust me. We would always try to bend the switches before we would get hit with them. Crooked ones don't hurt so bad as the straight ones. I mean, they hurt. But God can do what God wants to do even with imperfect things. If God wants to discipline you with a crooked stick, ladies and gentlemen, he can still discipline you with a crooked stick and still get his point across. So we begin to use these things that are, that maybe aren't so influential with, with everybody around us, okay? Many of you all know a guy by the name of Billy Graham, right? Billy Graham is very educated in North Carolina. Going to college, seminary. But how many of you all know about a gentleman by the name of Dwight L. Moody? Or commonly known as D.L. Moody. Let me give you his life story. It was in the 19, 1900s. He was an overweight, uneducated shoe salesman. That's who he was. He only had a third grade education. And he was told that he murdered the English language. You think I'm bad? <laughs> you think you're bad? D.L. Moody would have put you to shame. Okay? He was never ordained. He never attended a seminary. But God used him in the late 1900s, not only shaped this continent, but also he shaped Europe when he went there and began to speak. Once he was invited to speak to a group of educated clergymen in England, and here's what he started his message by. Don't never think that God don't love you for he do. D.L. Moody was a cracked pot. But God took that cracked pot. And that cracked pot is still influential in the world today. If you go to, if you go to Chicago, you will still see Moody Bible Church, the Moody Bible Institute, and Moody Publishing. Now, here's the last thing. 
A cracked pot will reveal more of God's glory than a pot that's not cracked. Amen. The Bible, when God said, listen, let there be light. Mark, I need you to do me a favor, buddy. Give me one minute, and then I need you to turn out the lights. If I don't burn myself first. You ever try to do this? It was called light the sucker before you put it in here. These things are childproof, man. No, I can't either. I got one. She's in Malaysia. You ever try to light something in here? It worked before. All I'm doing is melting the sucker. I went to the Wicked Witch. Now what's happening is... You're better at fire than I am, man. You're the, you're the pyromaniac. I said, I'm the city of Hamilton on fire one time. I know it. Remember that? Yes. I got in trouble. Wow, what's in there? Candle. got mine lit now. <laughs> don't trip that on my own. I don't trip it on the Bible. Now we can do it. Still on? Alrighty. Now you can turn them off. It'll work. So anyway. I can get this sucker to turn around here. Ouch. Actually, I don't think you can see any lights, man, because of this. But if you could see light, <laughs> if you could see light, <laughs> pull that sucker out. The problem is he's leaning up against the other side. That's generally what happens with me in life, man. Anyway. Illustrations that don't go the way you want them to go. Sorry about that. But anyway, huh? That's right. So anyway, if this would have worked right and I would have put a, a light bulb in there instead of a candle, you would have seen light coming through the cracks that are all through this thing. And this is what God's trying to say is that the light in your life will emanate through the cracks and the flaws of your life. When you've got it absolutely perfect and contained like this, you don't see anything. It's a total darkness. And this is why, understand people, when things happen in your life and you grumble and we complain about it, God takes those imperfections with this crack. Today it's cracked. And that is why tomorrow he will give you a new body with no cracks and no flaws. Because you want to know why? He doesn't need you to be a light in a dark world. Because in that place, we're going to reflect his light. He's not reflecting through us. He's reflecting off of us. 
and becoming in his presence. In the book of Judges, and I'll finish with this, there was a guy by the name of Gideon. Okay? And there was a group of people called the Midianites and the Amalekites, and, and they had invaded. One day, God told Gideon, I need you to go fight. Well, Gideon had a whole army. He gathered up his army of 32,000 soldiers. And he says, okay, God, I'm ready to go fight. And God says, too many. Gideon. So Gideon said, okay. Too many. Any of you all here afraid to fight? Go back home. So 10,000 of the soldiers left and went back home. So Gideon was left with, 20, with 22,000 uh, soldiers that were there. So what ends up happening? He ends up eventually getting down to 10,000. And God told him, he says, Gideon, that's too many. Because here's why. If there's 10,000 of those soldiers fighting Gideon and they win the battle, they'll think that they won it. And they won the victory. So Gideon told the men to go down to the stream by the water and drink. God told him this. He says, Gideon, every man who gets down and laps water on all fours like a dog, send him home. Keep only the ones who kneel and use their hand to drink. Out of those 10,000 that were there, only 300 of them actually took their hand and brought the water up to, the, to their mouth. God says, Gideon, that's your army. Now you go fight. What ends up happening, ladies and gentlemen, is that when you're overpowered, or you tend to win by all your might and all your strength, when you're overpowered, then what ends up happening is you tell God, I have no use for you. It's when you're overpowered and you realize, I don't have the strength to do any of this. God, will you put something in my, in my vessel? Will you help me? And God begins to start putting his power in your vessel. And he starts giving you the power to demonstrate that he can do these things. So let me say this to you. No matter how broken or flawed your pot is today, God can still use it. Amen. You see what happens with most of the time is Gotta make sure I don't burn myself. We begin to start treating our friends like this. There's chips missing. Who really wants to sit this on display? In my house, I mean, you know, my, my friends will come in and look and see that there's, there's ridges down here, there's a crack here, there's a crack here, and Pretty soon, what's going to happen is somebody's going to knock that vessel off where it, it's been cracked, and it's going to shatter into pieces. And what do we end up doing? We just throw it away. But can I tell you something? God doesn't do that. What God does with the vessels that are cracked and shattered as he starts putting them back together. Because not only does God know where all the cracks are, not only does he know where all the cracks are, he knows where all the broken pieces are. And God knows how to put all of that back together so that what ends up coming out of that is an absolutely perfect, beautiful, piece of work. 
And may I say this to you? Here's what God does. An artist is always very proud of their work. And what they love to do is they love to display their work for everyone to see. You know what God does with us? When he takes that crack pot and he puts it all back together, he takes this crack pot that is absolutely beautiful and God puts it on perfect display and says, look at what I made. I am proud of that creation. That is my trophy. My trophy of grace. So the next time that somebody tells you you aren't worth anything, you need to tell them, my God's got me on display. And the whole world, one of these days, and all of God's creations, going to see what he made. I've been able to see some of the most beautiful sights in the world. I've got to see the Grand Canyon. I've got, I've got to see uh, the Louvre in, in France. I've got to see the, the, the Cathedral of, Mount, of uh, Notre Dame. I've got to see where Mozart played the piano. I got to see some of his works. And it's awesome. When you go into the Louvre, I got to see the Mona Lisa. As little as that picture is. Everybody says it's so beautiful. But one of these days, I'm going to be able to see that. Amen. On God's display. For all to see. My grace. And you know what it's going to be? It's going to be all of his children. All of his children. And he's going to say, welcome home. Welcome home. I've been waiting for you. This morning as we get a song to sing, my question to you is this. How cracked is your pot today? Maybe you're here and you're not a Christian. And your pot you feel like life is nothing and so that's you and it just goes into pieces and maybe that's what your life is your life right now is just nothing but pieces and you don't know how am I going to put this thing back together let me say this to you you can't you can't the only one that can pick up all those pieces because there's some small pieces there is God When will you let him fill your pot with his power, with his glory, with his Holy Spirit? So that you don't have to worry about it because there are no cracks, there are no imperfections now. And when there is, he'll take care of it. And he's saying right now, like Jesus said, he said, listen, why don't you come to me, all you that labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You've been carrying these burdens for so long. And he's saying, come, take my yoke. Yoke up with me. Let me help carry those burdens with you. I, we can do it. We can do it together. You cannot do it alone. The question is this morning, what will you do? Let's stand together, okay? Hello, this is Pastor Chuck Cotton from Calvary Baptist Church. First of all, I'd like to say thank you very much for taking the time out to either listen to our sermon or to watch it on video. We are grateful that you've actually taken the time and hope and pray that it has been a blessing to you as it was to us as we delivered it to our congregation. We ask if you have any questions whatsoever that you email us at Pastor Chuck at CalvaryBaptistMiddletown.org or you could come in and give us a phone call, if you would please, at area code 513-423-7251. I'd like to take this opportunity to also invite you to come to our church and visit us, if you would please. We actually have small groups on Sunday morning starting at 9.30 with our morning worship following at 10.45. Prior to our morning um, small groups, we also provide donuts with coffee, um, milk, orange juice, a time for fellowship, get to know each other, have a good time before we actually break out into our small groups for Sunday. Our worship services are uplifting. 
They're fast moving and everything in our service is just a fast pace. But we do take time every once in a while to slow down as we feel the Holy Spirit moving and we never want to hinder it in any way. We also have on Sunday evening during the school year, we have Awana and Awana starts with the Puggles actually from age two all the way up through high school. And during that period of time, we also have a worship service. Both of these start at six o'clock and end at 7.30. Our Wednesday night, we have a Bible study, which starts at seven. We generally finish about 8.15. We would love for you to come and visit with us. Don't have to dress up, just come as you are, because to us, it doesn't matter. You're, you're a child of God, a creation of His, and so to us, you're important to everything that we do. Our motto here is building the kingdom one life at a time. And we hope that we have a chance to visit with you, get to know you as you get to know us. So thank you and may God bless you.